Welcome to Tuesday night of the STEAM Fair in a Box. I'm Janet Jefferson, the host of podcast Third Floor Views from Chesapeake Family Life. I'm so excited to be here and hosting this event tonight. Um, tonight's going to be another great lineup of really exciting um, speakers and demonstrations. So we're going to start off with Dr. Showell, and she's going to um, talk to us a little bit today about what it's like and to be a doctor. And then we'll also hear from Mathnasium, and they're going to play some card games um, and do some math tricks as well. Um, tomorrow night, we are going to be interviewing another professional in the STEAM career, um, and then on Thursday, Thursday night, we will have a talk uh, with the Anne Arundel County Magnet Programs. And after each interview, there will be a live demonstration of fun activities to do, followed by even more experiments um, for you to do using the materials in your box. Um, and then also things that you can find around your house. All interviews and activities will be recorded and available on chesapeakefamily.com slash steam so that you can go back and access them anytime you want and as many times as you want. Uh, don't forget that we are having a contest right now um, and you could win a three night stay at the Boardwalk Plaza Hotel in Rehoboth Beach. So how to do this is just snap a photo of every completed project that you've done from the steam fair um, box and all the associated experiments, and then post them on Chesapeake Family's Facebook or Instagram page. You can use the hashtag CFL Steam Fair or the hashtag Steam Fair 2020. Um, thank you also to all of our Steam Fair sponsors. And those include so many, and so a big shout out to them. And that includes St. Anne's School of Annapolis, Severn School, Mathnasium, who we're gonna hear from tonight, Chesapeake Arts Center, Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, and Girl Scouts of Central Maryland. So thank you to them um, for making all of this possible. Um, tonight's interview is with Dr. Nakia Shoal, and she is here in person. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, she is a doctor of medicine and has a master's of health science and a master's in public health. Dr. Shoal is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and she's also board certified general pediatrician and attending physician um, at the Johns Hopkins Harriet Lane Clinic. And then recently she became the associate medical director at the Harriet Lane Clinic, so congratulations. Uh, she also serves on the Pediatric Diversity Council and on the intern selection committee for the Johns Hopkins Pediatric Residency Program. So, Thank you so much for being here tonight. You are a very, very busy person. So thank you for taking some time out of your schedule. My pleasure. Um, let's sort of jump in. And my first question for you is really just what, what is it like? Um, can you tell us just a little bit about what you do? Sure. Um, so firstly, thank you so much for joining me today. It is so great to be able to talk to more families and more kids. Um, my everyday life, um, it, uh, it changes from day to day, but um, the, in general, I work with young, young folks like yourself and families every day. Um, depending on my schedule, I see patients in clinic, um, and I also um, do research on childhood obesity and specifically programs to help prevent um, childhood obesity um, for younger kids in the preschool age range. Um, I also teach. Um, I um, have some teaching responsibilities for medical students and also trainees for doctors who are learning to become pediatricians, uh, what we name, what we call residents um, or interns. And um, outside of that, I also am heavy into community service. So outside of my everyday job, I'm also very active in my community and serving programs and doing mentoring programs um, and other speaking arrangements in the local Baltimore area community. So my day varies from, you know, from day to day, but in general, I'm doing a little bit of everything, if that makes sense. Um, and all in all, it's my entire focus is focused on promoting the health and well-being of kids and families. And whether it's community service or whether it's working in clinic or whether it's doing research, whether it's teaching other younger doctors, um, how to be pediatricians um, or medical students and, and becoming doctors, it's all you know with that focus in mind. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like you are doing lots of different things. Um, do you have an average day? Um, and if so, what, um, what does that look like? Or maybe what does an average week look like? 
So um, it depends on my schedule, but in general, I'm in, I'm seeing patients only three or four in different times a week. Um, and outside of that, I have some duties as the uh, medical director of the clinic. So that would involve being uh, participating in meetings um, with other, you know, with the other medical directors and other leaders um, to make sure the clinic is running um, smoothly. And um, it also involves, you know, having some time set aside to prepare um, for those meetings um, and time set aside to, um, to write on different things to be able to support the programs and research that I do. Um, so we, um, as part of my job, I also write a lot um, and have to convince um, funders um, and other, you know, other entities to be able to support the work that I love to do. So that's another big part of my job as well. And then once the research is done, we have to be able to share what we found in the research um, in, in journal articles. So that's another part of what I do is writing, writing what I've done um, and um, being able to submit those to publish and be able to share those with other people. So again, I wonder is, if, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I wonder if, um, or at least I might be a little bit, I'm surprised, you know, how much writing that you're actually doing. Cause I think so often people think about STEM careers and think, you know, oh, this is a math and science, you know, yes, we do some writing, but you know, oh, writing's for those English majors. Um, but the importance of writing and needing to be a good writer. Um, and it, it sounds like not only are you doing scientific writing, so doing writing for journals, but um, also for grants and funding, you need to learn that type of writing as well, which is totally different. Absolutely. And when I, I think when I was thinking about being a doctor, I didn't think about the importance of writing and mm -hmm. that I would be doing this kind of writing. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I would be doing, you know, the writing needed necessary to do English papers in college right. um, and, and so forth. But I actually didn't think about a career in research or um, a, a career involving grant writing until much later, until mm -hmm. after I'd become a doctor. So mm -hmm. and I think it's important to have perspectives from different types of doctors because not all doctors um, do the same thing. Um, even pediatricians, um, not all of us are, you know, only seeing patients. Some of us are doing different things, writing and teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and other administrative duties, but I would not have expected, you know, that my career would involve what it does now. Yeah, definitely. Do you feel like you were naturally a good writer or did you sort of pick it up as you went along? That's a great question. I think, I think my mom uh, forced me to become a good, <laughs> good writer <laughs> because she had the foresight um, more so than I did, obviously as a kid, that regardless of what career I went into, I needed to have a solid foundation as a writer. Uh, my mom was an attorney. She wrote a lot for her job. And I, I knew that I didn't want to be a, um, an attorney. Um, and for some reason, I thought that it was because she, it was a lot of reading involved. But then I realized later that medicine also <laughs> involves a lot of reading. But the writing piece, I think that was something that she really pushed me to have a solid foundation in. And mm -hmm. this was even before I decided to go into medicine. And it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even just writing about about science, which I loved to do uh, when I was younger, but it was being able to express myself and express how I feel, creative writing and also biographic writing and, um, and also scientific writing. To be able to have skills in all different types of writing was something that she definitely reinforced. And also the teachers and professors that I had also, they pushed me to be a good writer. And I think it's important to have that skill set regardless if you go into medicine or not. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so let's talk about some of the fun stuff. What um, What's your favorite part of your job? Ah, seeing babies. I I love all my patients, but um, and I see patients up to twenty two. So much not just younger kiddos, but also adolescents and young adults. Uh -huh. But I love I love seeing babies and seeing babies over in multiple visits because you can see them grow and develop and just see how they change over time. It was a big part of why I wanted to be to go into pediatrics because and particularly be a general pediatrician and work in an outpatient clinic where I can see families of multiple visits mm -hmm. and, and sometimes very frequently like every two months in that first year of life you see the doctor um, when you're a baby you see the doctor pretty regularly for the first couple of years of life and I just love the idea of seeing someone as a newborn and then seeing them two months later and four months later and six months later and they're like so totally different and they do so many different things it's amazing and it still amazes me to this day um, when I see patients that I've known for six and nine years 
um, and uh, you know being at the same place for this, for this period of time and the the developmental changes and you know changes in life it's just it's really great to be a part of that as a pediatrician you feel part of the family and you feel like you have just great relationship and I really pride myself in having like great relationships with the patients and families that I serve it's the best part I love relationship building mm -hmm. yeah definitely so what about the hardest part what's the hardest part of your job yes uh there is a hardest there's a, there are hard parts and I think the biggest thing, I think particularly during this year is that is the time. So probably the, definitely the hardest part is just being able to balance what's needed of you as a, as a doctor with what's needed of you as a, as, as a person outside of work, right? Um, so doctors have lives too, and we like to do fun things both at work and outside of work. And you have to balance your other priorities. And um, leading up to this, I knew that I had to, I, was in for a long journey, invested a lot of time and training. Um, and I wanted to be able to, you know, pursue and be able to um, have the kind of career that really was very fulfilling, which it is for me, but also be able to, um, to live life um, outside of work as well. And I think the hardest part is just the hours that are sometimes necessary to get things done. Some weeks are long. And that's, and that's just part of the job. Sometimes I'm at clinic for long hours. Sometimes I'm in my office or even doing work at home for longer hours. Sometimes I work on the weekends, um, not every weekend, but sometimes I have to. Um, and sometimes I have to work after five and six o'clock at night, sometimes well into the evenings. Um, but I, I do it because I really, this is the one thing that you know, this is the only thing I can see myself doing as a, as a professional and it, it gives me joy, um, but it can be hard sometimes. And uh, I won't, you know, I won't minimize that. And I think it's helpful. I knew that as a younger person, people, doctors told me that, that this is going to take hard work. And I think it's great to be honest and understand some of the expectations involved with this kind of career. And especially when you're a general pediatrician who also does some other things outside of patient care, like I mentioned, research and teaching and, and helping to operate a clinic. There are other responsibilities that you have. So you have to balance all of that. Mm -hmm. um, how did you choose to be a pediatrician? And, and specifically too, not only did you choose to go into pediatrics, but then you, um, you were interested in research or you're doing research and then you're also um, really interested in obesity in children. So how did you make those decisions? Was that a hard decision? Um, and then thinking about, you know, kids who want to be doctors, you know, what would you, um, how do they go about that process of deciding what they want to do? Yeah. So for me, I it was probably about, I guess I was about 11 or 12. So the ages of some of the kids on, on, um, that are joining us this evening uh, in middle school. And I knew that I love science. I love biology. It was probably my favorite subject. And I loved figuring things out. Mm -hmm. um, I was not happy until I could figure out, you know, what this puzzle, you know, I figure out this puzzle or figure out this riddle. I like to figure things out on my own. And I was very hands-on. And I, I knew that I did not want to be an attorney after I thought I did when I was very young because my mom was. And then I realized she read a lot. And then I realized I needed to read a lot <laughs> later on too. <laughs> but uh, I think my love of science and coupling that with my desire to, to re build relationships with people and to interact with people and to, to help people to be, I was very heavily involved in community service. And I tried to figure out a career that could blend my interest in science and helping other people. And it was a natural fit. Um, pediatrics came about, I actually had the idea to be a pediatrician probably before I went to college. Um, and that was because, so two things happened. So at 14, I, my brothers, my twin brother and sister were born. So I had, as a 14 year old, as a teenager, I had experience with um, seeing babies grow up um, right in my own home and helping to, to take care of them. and. I thought it was amazing. I thought it was amazing how, you know, babies could grow up and, you know, how and the importance of a pediatrician or a family doctor in helping them, you know, be healthy. And I also had fantastic pediatricians. I went to an all female pediatric practice and I thought all pediatricians were female. <laughs> so I thought it was the coolest thing. <laughs> I was like, well, pediat pediatrics is for me because 
I'm a, I'm a young woman and all pediatricians are women and, <laughs> and the pediatricians and the staff. So this is it. Um, and I thought we could own, we could own our own practices. I can own my own practice with other women. And that's what I thought. I, th I really had this image in, my, in high school, like, okay, this is great. And while pedi pediatrics is, there are a lot, there are a lot of females, it's a female dominated field um, at certain levels. There are lots, it, there's definitely a lot of male pediatricians. So it's not a male, just, it's not just females in pediatrics and pediatrics, but that was, they inspired me. My own pediatricians inspired me and my experience with my brother and sister. So that's, I had an idea that pediatrics was a possibility. And then once I got into medical school, did my different rotations, I, I liked a lot of different things, but the, the, the rotations I liked the best were the rotations that I worked with kids and, and families and particularly um, in outpatient clinics. So I even had a sense that I wanted to be a doctor that worked in the general pediatric clinic, even as early as medical school. Um, and that solidified it for me and I applied to pediatric residency. And, um, and that started my journey to where I am. Um, as far as what it entails to become a pediatrician, as I mentioned, there's definitely a significant number of years in training required to be a doctor um, that they go by really, really fast. I will tell you that. Uh, college I thought was fast, but medical school is even faster because you're doing a lot of work, great work, you're learning. And those four years after college, they zoom by. So after college, four years, medical school, four years, and then you need to pick which field you wanna go into. And for me, that was pediatrics. And that was a residency program to train to become a pediatrician. And that was another three years. I, I did not know then that I wanted to be a researcher or that I wanted to um, uh, focus on, um, you know, having some administrative and, edu and teaching um, duties. It was not until I did my master's in public health um, after I finished my residency that I realized that I wanted to think about problems a little differently. And I wanted to be able to have the skills to try to figure out some of the, the biggest problems that we face in this country and abroad. And childhood obesity is one of those problems that I wanted to tackle. And I wanted to do something about it. I wanted to see patients, but I also wanted to be, be behind, you know, some of the changes that are necessary to make, you know, change on a more broader, bigger level. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought research was the way to do it um, and to be able to and change how we do things as practitioners and also how we do things as policymakers to really change the environments and um, um, and school environments and places where people live, those were all things that I was so interested in um, and trying to figure out and trying to address. Um, and I really did not think, I had not thought about a research career until, you know, I got more outside of my primary training um, and then, you know, landed here. And 10 years ago, you def I definitely would not have imagined having such a diverse career um, as I do now. Um, but it was really just being open-minded to the different possibilities and listening to mentors along the way and guides. Um, and I think that was really important. So you have to definitely be open-minded because what you think you may want to do may not necessarily be what you end up doing. And that's totally fine. That's totally okay. Um, and it goes one of the biggest pieces of advice that my mom gave me is just kind of go with the flow. Sometime you need to have goals, but it's okay to, to take this kind of path and not like straight mm -hmm. um, and that's okay. Everybody has their own path. Yeah, yeah, that's good advice. Um, so we've talked a little bit about, about writing that's involved um, and you just spoke about being open-minded. Um, are there other skills um, that lead to you being successful in your career? Yes, um, so I think you have to be relatively organized, <laughs> which I pride myself in being, but you, you do. Um, I think if you, have, if you have a career which is diverse, and I'm, when I say diverse, I mean that there's different parts of your career um, outside of patient care. Um, you have to be relatively organized and you have to be able to pivot, I think, relatively easily from one thing to one, another thing. Um, and, um, I think what also has brought me a lot of success is my, that I'm very collaborative and I, I like to, to work with other people. You have to be, you have to be willing to work with other people and not just working with the families and patients that you see in clinic, mm -hmm. but other people that are your colleagues and other people who are, who work with you, um, other staff members, you definitely have to be open to building those kind of relationships. Um, 
and that's really important part of, um, of what I do. Um, and that's really helped me to be successful up until this point. And staying, even though you're open-minded, you still have to set goals and try to be, try to stick to those goals um, because it's, it's easy to get swayed to do one thing, you know, and there's a lot of things going on, particularly in, in this world today. And if you don't have your goals, sometimes I have to write, write those down just to have a, have a reminder. Um, you have to be pretty diligent in trying to, you know, reassess, like, what's my progress? Have I done this? Have I taken this class? Next week, I'm supposed to have this done. So even if it's making check boxes, having some kind of system to remind yourself of what your progress is with regards to the goals that you set for yourself. And your goal could be at this point could be just let me one, let me explore if this is for me. Let me just shadow a doctor. Um, even as young as you know, tw 11 and 12, I knew that I had to put some things in place to be able to prepare myself. And um, that means setting some kind of goals, setting um, some kind of goals, even as young as you know, 11 and 12, or even younger, of where you want to be. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Goals, goals are definitely helpful. Um, any final tips for kids who want to go into medicine, whether that be like, oh, you got to take this class, or it's really helpful if you do this extracurricular, or even something more broad? Yes. So I would say um, have, write down a list of your of why you want to go into medicine. And it's something that I think I had in my head, but I never actually wrote down. Um, and I'm sure I can write it down very easily. But I wish I had something to just keep me to keep me grounded even in those earlier years. Because like as I mentioned, this is a really awesome career uh, that I have. But it takes a lot of time and it's a lot of time and money invested in be able to, to, to go down this path. So write down, make a list of the reasons why you want to become a doctor. Um, and also be open to exploring other careers if this is not the career for you. Um, I had some role models in my family. I didn't have, I did not have immediate family members who were doctors but I knew of persons that I wanted to at least have some experiences with to see if I you know, liked what they did on an everyday basis. And that's another um, suggestion. I know it's difficult during um, the, the present times to be able to have shadowing experiences, um, but it's great to be able to follow a doctor and see what they do every day. Mm -hmm. And having conversations and dialogues like this um, you know, to see what, a, what their average day looks like is absolutely absolutely essential um as far as courses and 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 um, preparation for training it it will be a difficult path if you don't have an affinity for science i would mm -hmm. say um if you absolutely don't like biology anatomy all of that doesn't sound like it's you know doesn't sound fun at all this will be hard um <laughs> it's not for science it's not i was not a fan of I'm not a fan of math, but I, it was something that I was decent at. Um, and you have to, you have to know what you don't know and you have to know what your strengths are and also know what things that you need to work on um, and know that early um, and really be, really try to figure out what, um, you know, what are the things I'm good at and do I like working with other people? And that's a big question to ask yourself. Do I like building relationships? Do I like working with kids? Do I like working with families. Do I like working with older adults. Um, do I like working in teams? Because that's, that's essential as well. You're going to be working with other people your entire training, during your entire training and during your career. Um, you can choose to be by yourself, but it's going to be a hard, hard path. So those are the questions you have to ask yourself early on. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, and I think, I think helpful with any career thinking about, you know, set those goals, but be open minded and, and think about, you know, what are you, what do you really like to do? And maybe what, what do you not like to do? Well, Thank you so much, Dr. Scholl, for, for coming and speaking with us today and answering all of our questions about what it takes to, to be a doctor. Um, and um, thank you so much for just taking the time out of your very busy schedule to be with us. So um, thank you again. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. You too. All right. So next we are going to transition to our demonstration this evening. Um, 
and I'm going to bring in uh, magnesium. And so magnesium is your our neighborhood uh, math only um, learning center that teaches kids math the way that makes sense to them. Uh, they just they deliver a customized learning plan designed to address each student's needs and instruction goes beyond traditional math tutoring to really develop understanding um, and also to build a love of math. So you too can fall deeply in love in math. So I'm gonna bring, um, bring in Kama and she's gonna come on um, with us. So she's gonna be joining us and, and Jimmy as well. So they're, they're connecting right now. Um, I will give them a second to connect. All right. Hello, Kama, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Hi, Jimmy, welcome. Hello, hello, thank you. So we're so excited that you um, are here tonight and you're going to um, show us some really, really fun things with math. Um, so I am going to hand it over to you um, and you're going to wow and amaze us. Um, and I can't wait to see it. Um, and then when you're done, just hand it back over to me and, um, and I'll wrap up for the evening. But I, I can't wait to fall in love with all the cool stuff that you're about to do. So take it away. Thanks. All right, thank you. So welcome everyone to STEAM Week, new to all of us virtual this year. And uh, what we want to do is make sure that you have your box with you and that you didn't open it before yesterday and get out the pack of goodies that Mathnasium sent you guys. So we have the Adam Morse Mac. We have the booklet of instructions, a deck of cards, and then you should have a set of polyhedral dice. So we're going to walk you through some games. The point of these games are to be played at a math night. And math nights were designed to help families, parents, and their students to math at home and math at home responsibly. Absolutely, it says it right in front, please math responsibly. Using some inexpensive items like a deck of cards, some dice, paper mats, and uh, for your family to have fun then and to build numerical fluency as well as just some math fun. So as we walk you through some different versions, um, you know, we don't know the age group of everyone who's watching. Um, we'll give you some ways to make it a little bit more advanced and a little less advanced. Um, so if you guys get to your booklet, um, the first game that we're going to play is heads up. And if you are a younger student and haven't studied multiplication yet, you can use the version of addition. And if you are an older student, you can use multiplication. So if you have three people to play the game, you would each get dealt a card. Since we are just in a group of two, you can still play this way. And Jimmy and I will show you this, okay? So Jimmy, here's your card. Okay. And the table becomes the second player. And so what I will do is I will add these two numbers. So the sum of these two numbers, I will reveal to Jimmy is 13. And so he is to then using the part on the table as well as the sum of the two numbers going to determine what number is on his, he's holding up on his head, not having seen it yet. So I can't see this. You said it's 13? 13, Jimmy. 13, I see three, so this has gotta be a 10. You're Got right, it. Jim. Good nice. job, buddy. All right. Sweet. So let's do another one. Sure. We've got, this time we have 20. 20. And I've seen eight. I'm going with 12. You got it, Jim. Nice. So that's, this is a really great way, especially using the magnesium cards. You can take out 11s and 12s for younger students if you're only working on numerical fluency through 10, uh, or you can incorporate them for some older students. Um, so that's the first way to play using the heads up addition. And then let's demonstrate with multiplication. Let's do it. All I'm right. Ready. So here's your card. And make sure when you play this game that you have someone on this end giving the, the correct product because they know the multiplication facts. Right? That's right. So let's see. I'm going to be put to the test here. So I'm coming up with now again, we're doing multiplication. So the product of these two numbers is 72. So 72. what do you think, Jim? I see an eight. It's got to be a nine. That is a nine. But how do I know it's a nine? Look at the card. That's a nine. Well, isn't it a six? This well, is a six. If you look inside, I see four here and four here. I know four plus four is eight. And then there's one in the middle. Eight plus one. 
that's not it. Yeah, so make sure when mom and dad make mistakes with the deck of cards, you correct them, okay? Oh, yeah. We've seen it live in person in math night, so make sure you young people are on your toes and keep mom and dad straight, okay? Oh, yeah. So let's They'll do one be more so proud to see you. Yeah, let's do one more multiplication. Uh, let's see, you know what? Let's, let me see if I can set this one up, Jimmy, because this is another okay. cool thing about the uh, mathnasium cards. Give that? this one back to me, no, I'm and I'm going to give you this one. Here you go. Yeah. All right. Let's see if we can trick Jimmy, okay? So I'm going to turn this card over, and I'm going to tell him his product is zero. Zero? Well, I see a three. Three times zero is zero. Right. So I'm going to go with zero. Go with zero, Jim. All right, let's see, let's see if you're right. Nice. Now Boom. let's let me trick. See if I can trick you, Jim. Okay. Let's see. All right, here you go. Here's your card. Now, what if I do that and I tell you the product oh, is zero? This is a zero. That means this could be anything. Yeah. Why can it be anything? If there's there's only one card on your head. Zero times anything is still zero. You tell me the product is zero. It's zero. Oh man. All right, I guess it could be anything then. Should I take a wild guess and see if take I get Take a wild guess. I'm going to go with two. Two. What is two times zero? Zero. What is 17 times zero? Zero. What is 3,422 times zero? Well, you just said it's zero. <laughs> it's zero. It's zero, of course. So moms and dads, you can always make sure you incorporate zeros. Uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of young kids don't understand the concept of zero. Um, so another great thing about the Mathnasium deck of cards, it comes with the zero uh, included in it. Have anything to add about Heads Up, Jim? Nah, just make sure that if you get really nervous and you're trying really hard to get it right, you don't get the cards too sweaty. Right? <laughs> and you don't turn it around and peek. Yeah, no, no peeking. peeking. All right, so the next page in our uh, activity book is sum up and sum down. Jimmy, you got your thinking cap on here tonight? I'm gonna try, that's what I'm here to do. Okay, so with this game, again, you can make it very competitive. If two eager friends want to, to go one against the other, put a timer on and see who can get to the higher sum of numbers. If you are just practicing numerical fluency, Pick a set number of cards, so maybe just 10, and have your younger student just add the 10. So let's start without the timer, and I'm just going to pick 10 cards, Jimmy, and okay. you can show them how to do sum up. These are slippery cards, brand new. Brand new. Brand new. All right. Just like what you guys got. So we can go very quickly. We can start up very slowly. Lots of ways to make it more advanced and less advanced. All right. So. Sum up. We got you want five. to hold that up, maybe? Sure, yeah. Okay. I got five for the first one. And then two, so seven. And then seven plus 10 is 17. Plus zero, still 17. Gotta love a zero. Plus three is 20. Plus three again is 23. Plus eight, that's 31. Plus 12. Ooh, 31 plus 12, that's 43. And then 43 plus 3, that's 46. And plus 10, plus 10 is easy. You just keep the 6. This one's 50. So that's one way to play it. Again, make sure you're playing with someone with good numerical fluency skills. You can check your answers. <laughs> um, so that's just a very easy way to play it. A more aggressive way is to put Jimmy against a timer. So let's see how high of a sum he can get to in a one-minute timer. Are you ready for this, Jim? I'm ready. All right. Here we go. Five. Seven. Seventeen. Oh, Twenty-one. Thirty-one. Thirty-six. Thirty-six. Thirty-nine. Forty-two. Fifty. Sixty-two. Sixty-five. Or seventy-five. Mm, Eighty-three. Ninety-three. 
167. Nice job. So oh Jimmy got gosh, up to 167. So Write that number down. And as you guys continue to practice it, get better with it at home, see if you can beat that number. Um, so that's a, a little bit more aggressive way. We'll show you two other very quick ways um, and both involve the sum down. So again, you can start with 100. We'll put the timer away for right now. And you start with 100 and you're going to subtract this from 100. So 100 minus 5, why don't you hold on this time, Jim? Yep, got it. Minus 2. 93. Minus one more. 92. 82. 78. Uh, 66. 56, 51. I think I counted 10 cards on. Is that 10? Yeah. Somewhere so again, there. you can pick a, a, de a definite number of cards and work back from 100 and, and play the game more laid back, or you can get aggressive with it. You ready to get aggressive? I'm ready. All right. So we're going to put him against a timer for one minute, and he's going to start at 100 and then sum down. Okay. Here we go. You ready? So ready. If you're at 100. All right. 100. 92, 83, 83, 80, 77, 75, 69, 58, 47, 35, uh, 27, uh, 15, 12, two, negative seven. <laughs> <laughs> you ready? Negative 13. Negative 13, all right, yeah. okay. Negative 15, negative 21. Now it's like I'm going up. Uh -huh. uh, negative 28, negative 29, negative 34, negative 43, or 42, okay. negative 42, <laughs> negative 52. Oh. Negative 53. All right, we're out of time. So again, remember, it's a lot easier to be on the, the side of the person who's dealing the cards than the one who's doing the math. So uh, be patient with that person. And again, it's just to have fun and to help you find fun ways at home so you can math at home. We hear so much about reading at home. It's also important to math at home. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sum up, or sum up or sum down, whichever version you want to play. Uh, the next one, Jim, is the sticky notes number line and the sticky notes fractions. Let's do it. So let's change over to the dice quickly here. You want me to start with the uh, number line? Mm -hmm. Okay. So for younger players, what we're going to do, just pick out a couple of appropriate dice, depending on the age or the map that you've uh, been involved in so far. I'm going to go with maybe these four dice, and you can get creative. So all we're going to do, does anyone know how to read the triangular or, or the pyramid die? You guys know how to read that? I know that. When you have the point, it says the same number all the way around that tip. Yeah, so you're reading the, the number up on the tip, the number that doesn't lie flat on the table or the desk. So in this case, it would be two. I'm sure you all cannot see that at home, um, but you read the number that's on the top, okay? So again, you can get as creative as you would like. Um, roll the dice. You wanna add numbers. Four plus four is eight. Plus seven is 15, plus one is 16. You can write your 16 on your sticky note or a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be a sticky note. And then we'll go again. You can get more creative with the dice. If you wanna talk about place value, you can assign each a place value, 1,454, so another way or version to play it. Jimmy, you want to roll your dice once? See what you get? Same ones that you did. Okay. All right. Looks like I got two fours and two fives. That'll be easy. Four and four is eight. Five and five is ten. Ten plus eight is eighteen. That down as well. Okay. So we're each going to take five turns 
and of each of the terms, we'll write the, the answer on a sticky note, and then we will order those five sticky notes from least to greatest. Oh, that's a better way to put it. Huh? Like that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> oh, I uh, so uh -huh. All right, let's see what else I got. I'm going to go with... All right, I'm going to go ahead and take my other three terms for you. Go for it. Four thousand nine hundred fifty-two. Four thousand nine hundred fifty-two. Big numbers. Got two fives again. Love to see that. Ten. Oh, doubles again. Three, three, six. I'm going to do 10 times six. six. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accidentally drop one of these dice on the floor. She's a wild man, folks. I'm getting a lot of doubles, Ken. I don't you know are? about you. Yeah. I've got three rolls of two sets of doubles. Love doubles. Doubles are so much fun. Oh, yeah. All right. How many do you have? I have five. I'm done. Yeah. Take right. your last roll. Six, five, four, and four. I got another set of doubles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Almost got it again, too. Let's do 30 times eight. You're doing some multiplication in there with yours. Yeah. All right, so again, at, at home, moms and dads, you can take what your students have been recently learning and incorporate it. Jimmy did some multiplication. I tried to mix it up with some place value. You can certainly stick with the uh, smaller numbers for younger folks and talk about place value. And then the point of it is to take your five rolls and get them in order from least to greatest. Do you have yours in order, Jim? I sure don't. Let's see. 240. Your greatest is this way? Uh, yes. Okay. 240. I want it for the big. audience. That's left even right. bigger. 4,000. 60. 16. That's smaller than 60. 18. It's pretty close. Okay. I think I'm set. Boom. Oh. Boom. <laughs> Okay, so that's uh, sticky notes number line. And if we were then to move up maybe to third or fourth grade students uh, who have been introduced to fractions, we can play the sticky notes fractions. Uh, so what we do with fractions to begin with is always leave the numerator as one. And I would pick an interesting die, maybe the 12 sided die for the denominator. So I'm gonna roll, I got one tenth. Why don't you roll yours along and we'll just play together, Jim. That works. I want them twice. You gonna go with 12 also? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. I got one fifth. I got one eighth. I'm getting duplicates. Are you? Yep. And that's good. One, yeah. 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 Changing up die in between terms is encouraged. Maybe we can do this, Jeff. Work. Are you putting yours in order? I'm putting mine in order. So nice. I'm going from nice. least over over to the audience left to greatest to the right. Sounds good to me. Boom. 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 Yeah. Okay, so then this is the smallest fraction, right? So for sure. mine, one half is the smallest fraction. And then one fifth. So one fifth is bigger than Wait one half. What, Jimmy, don't stop the production. We're live. Well, one half is huge. What do you mean huge? Well, holy shit. If I got a circle looking like that, and I color in half, and I put a line down the middle, look how much of this thing will 
for learning. Okay, but one fifth five is bigger than two. One fifth is bigger than one. No, half. look at this. I do another circle. I'll color in a fifth. Let me show you. I don't know why he's stopping this production this way, guys. There's five pieces in that, don't you agree? Okay. Five pieces. Well, if I color in one of them, one fifth is way. So I'll label it for you. I'll even label it for you. Yes, one fifth. One half. Jimmy, you're going to have to explain that more to that. One because five is, is bigger than two. One How does that work? Huge. Well, if your denominator has a bigger number in it, it's going to have a lot more pieces to make that whole. So the bigger the denominator, the smaller the fraction. Does that okay. make sense that to you? That does make sense. So then I have to reorder mine. So let's work from the right to the left. There we go. One eleventh, one tenth, one eighth, one fifth, and one half. Now we're thinking. And I like the order of yours as well when we cool. go from the right to the left. So again, moms and dads, guardians, parents, grandparents, everybody at home. Lots of ways to mix it up and have fun with fractions, make it more of a challenge rather than a, oh, why do you keep asking me about fractions moment? So we did the numerator as one. I would, I would recommend you use the triangular pyramid uh, die to begin with when uh, introducing the numerator. Uh, because this only has one through four, it will be easier for new students uh, learning fractions to use uh, this as the numerator yeah. and maybe the 12 sided die as the denominator. Yeah. And then of course with advanced, uh, advanced students, you can mix it up all together. And as they get toward middle school, you can even start talking about finding common denominators. Absolutely. Okay, so then we have one more to demonstrate for you guys. And then we'll see if we have the capability to share the screen. We'll see if we can trick Jimmy. Um, but right now we have atomorphs. So we're, we're going to change back to the cards and the map that came in your kit as well. Just got to unfold it. It should look just like this. I'll hold it for you. Okay, so again, ways to make the game more advanced or easier. The uh, easiest or uh, less challenging way to play the game is to just play it open-handed. So two players can play and what you're looking for is a way to make a true number sentence. Getting some high cards in here, Jim. I didn't stack the deck right. Oh so boy. what you want to do is always keep one of the numbers the same and change the other two. So right here, we're starting with one plus two equals three. That's true. Let's keep the one the same. One plus 10 one equals plus 10. 11. You didn't come up with a good board here. Ten. There you go. You got it. So see how I kept the one and I changed the other two. Now, on top of that, I would continue to build. So what if I do... One plus 10 is 11. Okay. What if I do... I'm looking to try to set it up. Uh, you got it. Two, yep, here I got it. Let's see. So here I've got uh, zero. I'm going to put here zero. I'm going to leave the 10. So zero plus 10 That's is 10. 10. Right. And then I would change the 11 to the 10. Perfect. And so uh, you can continue to build on top of the decks. You don't have to clear the mat every time and continue to play in an open handed, uh, taking turns fashion. Okay, if you want to be competitive, you have a friend over, you want to compete against mom or dad, then what you would do is deal out the deck. So you would deal out five cards to each player, and they play just a closed hand then. You want to put the deck down, I mean the mat down, Jimmy, and we can just play a hand. All right. These are my cards? Those are yours, Jim. All right. So I got. I'm going to go first. I'm gonna yeah. change the zero to a nine. So we get nine plus one, nine plus one ten. equals 10. So it's a true number sentence. I've changed two of the numbers and I've kept one. And then I can replenish my hand with two new cards. Mm. Do you have anything that'll work to me? I sure do. I like your one that you put in the middle. Okay. I'm gonna do eight and one. You know what? I'm gonna put an eight in. I'm gonna do seven and one makes eight. Nice. 
and then he would replenish his damage. If you ever get stuck, it turn in two cards and get two new ones. If you get really stuck, get a new set of five cards. So again, ways to play it uh, more advanced and then just more uh, laid back. Okay. Now let's see. So that's that's it for the uh, booklet. Um, there's a coupon on the back if you guys would like to come try us all out. We always offer a free trial, um, and then there's an additional coupon for a membership. So. Um, you want to see, I think Ms. Donna left us with sharing, screen sharing capability. Hopefully. Walk me through this, Jimmy. Just do this here, and then I'm going to go to the calculator. Yep. Okay. So the point of this trick is we're going to trick Jimmy. So we're going to start with a three-digit number. <laughs> and we're going to multiply that three-digit number by any three or four-digit number. So Jim, why don't I, why don't you get me set up and then you can go hide your eyes. I just need the calculator at the bottom. Right. I think hit the bottom share and then just go to the calculator. They're going to see my tabs, but that's okay. Okay, there we go. All right, so Jimmy, you have to go turn around. Okay. And so we're going to start with this three-digit number that I'm going to put into the calculator. So this is a great trick for you to try on mom and dad, or your teacher would be great, or just a friend, okay? And again, it's just going to build numerical fluency skills. So I'm starting with this number, and I'm going to multiply it by a three- or four-digit number. Hey, somebody here, can you give me a three- or four-digit number? 632. I have 632. All right, so I'm going to get this answer. I'm not going to say it, okay? But what we're going to do is we're going to read the digits in the answer in any order that we choose, and we're going to leave out one, one of the digits, and we're going to see if Jimmy can guess that digit, okay? So are you guys ready? Are you ready, Jimmy? I'm ready. All right. So if we were in person, I would call up a volunteer and let you all pick a digit, but I'm going to go ahead and pick the digit that we're going to leave out, and then I'm going to mix up the other ones. All right. So you ready, Jim? I'm ready. Six. Mm. Okay. I lost my voice. I got choked up on this. It's so fun. Six. Uh -huh. We're starting again. Okay. Ready? Yep. Six, two, three, six, three. And now if you're playing along at home, you should see the one digit that I didn't read to Jimmy, and he's going to tell me the answer. So what digit did I not read to you, Jim? I'm going with seven. Seven. Absolutely right. Yeah. Elbow bump or something. You're leaving me hanging. There you go. All right. So let's try one more. I sure do wish I could have one of you guys from at home uh, play along. Can I have a three or four digit number? 234. Thank you. Oh, that wasn't very interesting, though. Let's see. We might have to mix this up a little bit. All right. So, you ready, Jim? I'm ready. I'm going to leave one digit out. So, I'm going to give him nine, nine, eight, eight. So, I read four of the five digits, leaving one of them out. What is the answer? What is the missing digit, Jimmy? Going with two. Two. So for those of you playing along at home, why don't you turn around, Jim, and we can explain this trick to them. Did I get it? You got it. Of course you got it. Of course. I think you would be fired if you didn't get it. <laughs> so uh, let's start with you. Why don't you start the, the premise of the, the, the trick as it is? So the trick starts out with that number that Kayla had going on there. It was 423. See that? Now. 423 is a number that's divisible by nine. Okay? How do you know that? And the reason I know that is because there's a divisibility trick for nine. And that trick means that all you have to do is add up the digits. So four plus two plus three. If you add those up and get a number that's divisible by nine, then that number itself is divisible by nine too. So four plus two is six plus three again is nine. Nine definitely goes into nine. So that means nine must also go into 423. All right, so that's the key to this. You have to start with a number that's divisible by nine. Yeah. Going forward from there, you can multiply that number by any 
three or four digit number. Okay. So let's try 5,217. So, then this one, so the now we're going to pick uh, so six of the digits five. to read and we're going to sure. leave one out. So I'll just read them in reverse order, Jimmy. One plus Go nine is? 10. Plus seven? 17. Plus six? 23. Plus zero? 23. Plus two? <laughs> 25. 25. So now how do I know what's missing? Yeah. Well, if we started with a number that's divisible by nine and multiplied by anything, that number also has to be divisible by nine. So for this number here to be divisible by nine, everything must add up to something that's divisible by nine. So far, we've added up all the way to 25, right? Well, for this number to be divisible by nine, the sum of those digits can't equal 25. Nine doesn't go into 25. Nine does go into 27, though. Which so, is the next multiple of nine. So, go for it. Yep, we're looking for the next multiple of nine, yep. which in this case is it's 27. Yep. So, for us to get there from the 25 that we stopped at, we just need two more. And that's that last digit right there. It's a two. That's how we get to it. So, if you guys want to try this at home, I would recommend you start with 423. Multiply that by any three or four digit number, have mom or dad turn around, you hide your eyes, however you would like to pull the trick off and, and give it a go. Um, whether you use a hand calculator or a, an app calculator, it doesn't matter. Uh, the fun will still exist. And, you know, we cannot wait until we return in person to Math Nights and get to high five That's for sure. and, and show you this in person. But until then, we are so grateful to have this opportunity to have this virtual STEAM fair. I hope you guys are having a blast this week. I know there's a lot more fun to come. Enjoy your boxes. What have I forgotten, Jim? Just make sure you keep show, showing your friends these games because if I have a student come in and show me that they've already seen this game before, that would make my day, guys. That would be so awesome. It sure would. So thank you, guys. I am going to stop share. <laughs> and I think we have Miss Donna back. Thank you so much. That was so much fun. And Jimmy, you did an awesome job. You were definitely in the hot seat for a while, but I was very My impressed. Um, and I loved I, that nine trick was so cool. I thought you had superpowers at the end, um, but but now I too have superpowers. So I'm feeling feeling pretty good. Um, so thank you so much um, for, for coming on and sharing some really awesome things, including some really awesome dice. Um, and so... Um, great work, Math Mathnasium, and thank you to, to Jimmy and Kama for coming on tonight. So thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great week. You too. All right, guys. So to wrap up tonight, we're just going to talk a little bit about what's in your box. So tonight, the activities you have in your box include, you can make some homemade GAC. There's also an architecture challenge. Um, you can find videos on chesapeakefamily.com. Uh, slash steam to find all those videos to walk you through those activities. Um, and remember that you can do these activities whenever you want and you can do them as many times as you want. Um, also on that same page, so just a reminder, it's chesapeakefamily.com slash steam. You will find a video on how to build a stethoscope, which is so cool. You get to build your own stethoscope. And that's sponsored by Annapolis Pediatrics. And there's also a fantastic video on land preservation, which is sponsored by Scenic Rivers Land Trust. So I know it's getting late. I know you've been through a lot tonight, heard a lot of cool stuff, but this video is so awesome. So maybe not tonight, maybe tomorrow, but definitely check it out. It's really, really worth it. So um, we hope to see you again tomorrow. Um, we're gonna be speaking with Tammy Domanansky tomorrow, who's the director of the Environmental Center at Anne Arundel Community College. We also have an exciting demonstration from the Maritime Museum. Um, and then don't forget that we are having that contest and you too could win a three night stay at the Boardwalk Plaza Hotel in Rehoboth Beach. So make sure that you do take those pictures and um, post them. Um, so you need to make sure they're of a completed project and put them either on Facebook, um, on Chesapeake Family's Facebook page or on our Instagram page with the hashtag CFL Steam Fair or Steam Fair 2020. So that's it for tonight. Have fun and thank you so much for joining us. Um, stay tuned for tomorrow. It's going to be another great night.